everyone. It's your friendly neighborhood, Sarah Silverman. Did I talk about bumping into Catherine Hahn? I don't think I did. And having just, I, I bumped into her outside of a, um, in the parking lot. We were both recording Bob's Burgers. She was leaving and I was just getting there. And we had a total fucking come to Jesus. Ugh. Ugh. It was awkward and uncomfortable and kind of wonderful. And we both felt so many feelings. I mean, and and here's the woman who, you know, I don't want to bring it all up again. I just, but I love her so much. And she did nothing wrong uh, at all. She is a, a brilliant actor who plays many kinds of roles. A bunch of them happened to be Jewish in a time when I was noticing, noticing, just noticing out loud on this podcast that Jewish actresses rarely get to uh, play Jewish-centered roles, and it's weird. And it's weird, especially in this time where representation is so front and center in art and, and everything. And yet, to quote David Baddiel, not for Jews. Jews don't count. That said, each of these Gentile, non-Jewish actors, actresses, they're just that. They're actors. Actors act. And I've always couched what I said with that. There's no bad guy here other than all of us <laughs> as a society, I guess. But the request is just to notice. It was just to notice. Anyway, she got tons of shit after I talked about it on the podcast, and it was awful for her. And, oh, God, was that, that is not what I intended, you know, but certainly what I caused. And I'm responsible for her having a very hard time for a while there, and I feel fucking awful about it. She is... So special, so wonderful, so brilliant, as I've said again and again, but still, oh, I, I just feel awful. And, uh, you know, look, I still stand by what I said. I think this stuff is worth noticing, but there's obviously a lot of gray area and it's messy. And the point is uh, that bumping into her was important for me. And I was able to see the detritus left behind by my words. And I just feel, oh, off. Man, I, I, you know, boy, is she someone who does not deserve to feel bad about her brilliant work. And she was bumping into her, you know, she was so gracious and she totally gets it and she was supportive of what I was talking about, but also like, grappling with this guilt over being an actor committing the crime of earning acting roles. I felt like shit. She felt awful. We got through the other side of it together. She was in her car and I was walking in. She's like, Sarah, you know, so the whole thing happened with me, like, hanging on to her, like, driver's side window, like, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> it was It was kind of lovely. I am, as I've always said when talking about this shit, a massive fan of her work. And now I'm overdoing it. But, you know, I just adore her work. I adore adore her as a human. So, you know, it was interesting. But, man, life is messy. You know, this stuff is messy. Actors are actors. They play people other than themselves. But we're living in a moment in time right now where uh, some stuff that in a perfect world shouldn't matter matters. I actually just got to play a real-life three-dimensional Jewish woman, which was very cool. And, you know, sometimes speaking out about something doesn't mean there's a bad guy in the problem. It's just all of us, like I said, the the status quo or a sign of the times. I don't know. It shouldn't matter. And in a true, real-deal, post-racist time, none of it will matter. So I look forward to that. I hope that day comes. Anyway, I love you, Catherine Hahn. And uh, uh, I'm the countdown to tonsil gate, tonsil gate, (laughs) getting my tonsils out is uh, approaching. (sighs) The countdown is approaching? That doesn't even make sense, Sarah. 
there's we're here, we're counting down. We're getting closer to the date, and I'm bummed about it. I'm trying to like not have it in my head so I can enjoy the days before this happens. But holy shit, I'm like nervous about it. I'm scared something's gonna go wrong. Even if nothing goes wrong, it's gonna fucking hurt. I don't like it, you know? And then I tell people and they go, well, you can eat ice cream. I already can eat ice cream. (laughs) I can eat ice cream without a bloody throat already. But I'm trying to be like Georgie Shapiro, my friend who died of old, you know, he was in his 90s, but he went into everything and he'd go, I'm not afraid. So I'm trying to just say that. I'm not afraid. All right, let's take some calls. You left me a message. Now I'm playing it for the world. Let's hear some voicemail. Hi, Sarah. My name is Mitch. I'm from northern New Jersey. And my, I mean, my mid-50s, I've been married for a long time. My adult son recently came out to me, and my wife is gay. And he described his process and his thinking, and we were fine with this, his process and how he came to terms with this, and the feelings he had towards men. And as he was talking, I realized this is how some of the things that resonated with me. Like I probably have had these feelings toward men, but not as conscious as more suppressed. And talking about it, I realized that there is a friend, or not a friend, but someone I admire, who is uh, uh, who I've had a crush on for years. Uh, his name is Gary. Uh, he's my little Baba Booey. <laughs> Is that a, wow? That is fucking amazing. I, I isn't that interesting? I mean, I to be open enough to learn about yourself through your kids, or or anyone from the younger generation to to be inspired to be open and realize things about your own self. What a gift! And to be truly affected by it, changed by it, maybe freed by it. That is mazel, my friend. That is so cool. So much freedom in allowing yourself to feel your feelings without any judgment or any fear. I'm so, I don't know you, but I'm so proud of you. And I just think that's fucking cool. And are you seriously talking about Gary Delabate? Maybe from his mustache days? All right. Baba booey to you. A baba booey to you, sir. Uh, What else? Here's some ads. You know, it's it's important to have a safe home. I'm talking about Simply Safe, baby. My friend Brett had his whole house Simply Safed, and he loves it. There are a ton of home security systems out there to choose from these days. You got to be careful when it comes to protecting your family, guys. Some of these old school companies that set you up with outdated technology, overcharge you for service, and lock you into binding multi-year contracts... Yeah, stay away from that. Simply Safe is a product that you can trust and one that I want to recommend to you guys. Simply Safe protects you with cutting edge security technology powered by 24 7 professional monitoring agents who always have your back, giving you peace of mind. Simply Safe's agents call you the moment a threat is detected and dispatch police or first responders in an emergency, even if you're not home or can't be reached. Their agents will give you a call the moment a threat is detected and dispatch police or first responders in an emergency. Simply Safe blankets your home in protection with advanced sensors for every room, window, and door. HD security cameras for inside and outside, smarter ways to detect motion that only alerts you when a threat is real, and even hazard sensors that instantly detect fires, floods, and other threats to your home. Simply Safe's customer first policies make sure you're taken care of with affordable plans starting at less than $1 a day and no long term contract or hidden fees, because feeling safe at home should not break the bank. Don't miss this chance to save big when you protect your home with the best. 
Get 40% off your order when you visit simplysafe.com slash Silverman today. Customize the perfect system for your home in just a few minutes. That's simplysafe.com slash Silverman. There's no safe like Simply Safe. Oh, guys, we're busier than ever these days, and your day is filled with all those to dos, laundry, emails, errands, cooking dinner, and before you know it, you're preparing to do it all again tomorrow. When is there time to focus on what you need? With Calm, you can prioritize your most important to do, which is taking time for yourself each day. We are partnering with Calm, the number one mental wellness app, to give you the tools that improve the way you feel. Reduce stress and anxiety through guided meditations. Improve focus with curated music tracks and rest and recharge with Calm's imaginative sleep stories for children and adults. There's even new daily movement sessions designed to relax your body and uplift your mind. I downloaded Calm a while ago. I just, it's so helpful to just get quiet and usher out any thoughts in your mind and to have a guide for that on your phone is just awesome. If you go to com.com slash Sarah, you'll get a special offer of 40% off a Calm premium subscription and new content is added every single week. Over 100 million people around the world use Calm to take care of their minds. Calm is ready to help you stress less, sleep more, and live a happier, healthier life. For listeners of the show, Calm is offering an exclusive offer of 40% off a Calm premium subscription at calm.com slash Sarah. Go to calm.com slash Sarah for 40% off Unlimited access to Calm's entire library. That's calm.com slash Sarah. And we're back. Hey, Sarah. It's Emily from Pittsburgh. I've called a few times. Um, I just wanted to make a comment about the gentleman that you had call in um, a few episodes ago talking about uh, toxic masculinity and kind of he opened up the idea to the female version of that. I'm not really sure where, you know, he wanted to take this, but I do see a culture um, of women nowadays that's kind of concerning to me. And it's not really, you know, maybe the same level as toxic masculinity, but um, just with social media and, um, you know, the ability of our voices being so loud, um, the way that women treat each other sometimes is just ridiculous. <laughs> um you know, the way we bring each other down, the way that we talk about each other, especially like famous people, you know, I understand famous people have a lot of money, but they're also people too. You know what I mean? Um, the way that other women bring other women down, I think it's just kind of, um, counterintuitive because, you know, we will bash a man for bringing us down in those ways, but women ourselves are allowed to do that to each other. I just don't see how that is, uh, right or how that's good for our feminist movement. Um, I also received a lot of crap whenever Hillary was running for president because personally, um, I'm not a huge Hillary fan. Um, I have my own reasons, but, um, in my feminist groups, uh, I was exiled a lot because I should vote for her because she's a woman and she's a feminist. Yeah. Um, what do you think about that? Love you. Yeah. I, interesting. It's definitely a thing. And, and I obviously also got flack and stuff, but, uh, and voted for Hillary, of course, but. Yeah, that kind of like, don't even say one thing about her because we have to vote for her and, and we're she's the best and blah, blah, blah. Like, of course, I'm, I voted for her. I wanted her to win. I was excited for her to win in the end. I mean, I was a Bernie person, but of course voted for Hillary. But yeah, I agree. I think she's a really interesting woman. Cooler than she gives off in general is my guess, you know, as people who know her seem to think you know, seemed to love her. And I loved when she went on Howard Stern. I mean, man, I wish she did that before the election that, you know, in 2016. And don't get me wrong, I wanted her to win. I was, you know, especially when it was down to her and that scumbag snake oil salesman. And I was excited about it and about what she represented, the first woman president. But she didn't campaign enough in the really important states, and it felt like she felt like this job was owed to her. That said, it's ironic as fuck that I'm talking about humility when uh, Trump won that presidency, you know, <laughs> like the least humble person ever to exist. I mean, 
he lost the popular vote by, I think, over three million votes. But yeah, he he won that presidency. But uh, yeah, and I, you know, people just, you know, especially like when you're a Democrat, you cannot criticize anyone on the left, anything on the left, or or you're a fucking asshole, or you're, you know, tr- helping the right. What happened to being able to criticize your government or criticize, like, your people because you want it to be the best it can be? You know? I mean, ugh. There's an arrogance there that worries me, but there are a lot of people that are running that I'm excited about. I fucking hope Beto wins. I fucking hope. So many people, like, you know, and so many, Ab- Stacey Abrams for governor. I mean, oh, it could be real exciting. Anyway, what else? Hello, Ms. Silverman. Oh, I need your opinion on something. I want to know if you think pretty privilege exists. Have <laughs> you seen many forms of it? Have you experienced it? I want to know because I am dealing with it, something fierce, at my work and have been for a while. And for those of you that may have not heard of Pretty Privilege before, it's literally just the skinny pretty girls who they just, they get whatever they want. They get treated differently. They get treated with more respect. They literally get more attention. I've literally had one of the Pretty Privilege girls walk past my desk and the manager I was talking to, a male, literally stopped talking to me and followed her because he needed to ask her something. And it was purely like out of a visual response because he was like, oh, you know, he didn't even have to talk about work. He was just not interested in talking to me anymore. I've never considered myself a conventionally attractive person or an unconventionally attractive person. I've just not (laughs) been one of the pretty privileged girls. I'm loud. I'm big. I'm hilarious. I'm funnier than most people I know, particularly men. And I feel like People have a problem with that. And particularly men are just so like, they don't like a big, loud, over the top bitch. But I'm 31, I'm never going to change. But I want some fucking respect. What's your opinion? Would love to know. Yeah, you never hear, uh, oh, she's got unconventional bad looks. Yeah, no, 100%. Does pretty privilege exist? I mean, you know, I always think about like all the pretty girls that are like, everybody's so nice here. <laughs> Yeah, it dominates. The caveat is it doesn't grow. You know, it doesn't last. You can't build on it, per se, over the course of a long lifetime, you know. You're funny, you're fun, you're smart. I yeah, I think that's better. It lasts longer. I don't know, your colleagues don't respond to that. Again, when your bosses are male, straight or gay, they there will be pretty privilege. <laughs> You know, the pretty girls will get more attention. And it's, you know, not their fault. Don't blame that. You know, they're not, I don't know. You can hate them, but you can also just not hate them because they're just pretty. They can't help it. But when you work with people, getting along with others is, you know, it's kind of like part of the job, right? And if you are funny and you are kind, that's a recipe for popularity. So focus on you. Maybe get some uh, sisters to notice the disparity in treatment. But, you know, keep track. Write them down. I don't know. So not to report to HR, but just to point out to friends in the office, you know. So you can kind of, like, get some uh, mindfulness around it. Maybe. I don't know if that's the right answer. I mean, don't gang up on the, the pretty priv girl because it's not nice. You know. She's just a person, but she also probably isn't seeing that disparity (laughs) Uh, because she's busy going, everybody's so nice here. Just observe and report and get a a mindfulness going around the office, maybe. Or maybe just, you know, find other ways to be, uh, to get along and to be heard. Maybe some non-women friends, too, where, where it's awareness without judgment that will you know, it's it's awareness without judgment that will probably be the best chance for change. You know, not just for you, but all the future yous. But in the meantime, I mean, you know, you got to just uh, figure out how to make it work and how to be heard and um, get along with others. That's on you. P.S. LOL. I'm 31 and I'm never going to change. Oh, God bless. Uh, what else? 
Hi, Sarah. I was listening to your episode 80, where you're talking about being nice to people who you find kind of awful. And I can tell you from my own life experience that it absolutely does make a difference. Um, I find that positivity begets positivity. Yes. Uh, and so I have a personal policy that if I think something nice about somebody, I tell them, uh, even if it's awkward, even if I don't know that person very well, um, you know, if I just walk by somebody and think, oh, wow, her blouse is pretty, I tell her about that um, because you never know who needs to hear it. I had somebody at work who was just kind of objectively awful and negative all the time. And I wondered what would happen if I just started to, you know, meet that negativity with as much positivity. And so I found something that she did really, really well. She made amazing chili. And so I would always talk to her about how awesome I thought it was. And she, you know, because occasionally she would bring it in for everybody, which was really nice. But again, she's really negative most of the rest of the time. And, you know, just by the nature of just being positive and saying, you know, affirming things to her, uh, she definitely, you know, her, her attitude changed in a, in a palpable way, in a, a you know, perceivable way. And, um, you know, I just want to say, you know, it, it, it can't hurt to say the thing. It can't hurt to be no. nice. So, you know, say the thing because you never know who needs to hear it. Yes, say the thing. I fucking love this. And just like you said, it takes nothing from you. And the fruits of it are so cool, potentially, you know, like, uh, you know, if Sally is a bummer at the office, but she brings in chili sometimes and you start going, Sally, when are you going to bring in that chili? I need it. It's the best. You know, some people to feel appreciated, to feel even needed, they have not experienced this and they need it. Give it to them, you know. Uh, to give them a little, just a little appreciation can change their whole outlook, you know? You only have to change someone's perspective one degree for the whole world to look different. And I know I say that a bunch, but it's really true. What a gift to both of you. But you're right, it's energy. I fucking love it, you know? it Energy cannot be created nor destroyed, but it can be changed. Like negative energy is so catchy, positive energy is catchy, and you can change them. You can convert them. You did it. It's so fun. Anyway, well, good on you. I feel like British people say that. All right, what else? Hi, Sarah. My name is Jamie, and I am from Naperville, Illinois. And I wanted to know if you Bob have is any from. suggestions or advice for those such as myself that are on more on the shy, quiet side, but trying to stand up for themselves or be more assertive in situations when they need to be, but the other person doesn't take it seriously. So... <clears throat> excuse me, in the last couple of years, I've been learning to speak up more when I need to, but it just seems like the other person just kind of brushes it off or just not take it as seriously as it should, as they should. And I want to know what your thoughts on on that. And if you can, you know, help share some advice and for, for, for people like me and for others too, who are experienced the same thing, I would greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much, and I hope you have a great day. Bye-bye. Yeah, this is like feeling like they're not listening or not being heard. It's This is good news, but it's on you, and you can learn how to do this. I'm going to say start talking to yourself when you're alone because it's it's really an awkward feeling, and you have to like push past the weirdness and just start talking out loud to yourself when you're alone. And get used to it and get comfortable doing that. And breaking through that weirdness and getting used to that is a great way to then bring it to your outside life. You know, there's like a real art to being heard. And you have to, you have to push your voice past your mouth hole. You know what I mean? Like sometimes shy people or more quiet people, they, they, they don't physically get their voice out there um, because of shyness or a, an, a, a feeling of unworthiness that you've got to figure out and get past. It's not about being loud. It's about being clear and confident. And I know this sounds odd or maybe corny, but even find a voice teacher. 
not a singing teacher, although that also might help um, in a similar way, but a, like a voice class, just to learn to use your voice clearly and confidently. You know, I have a friend who's a, a writer-director, and he's very shy and shy with strangers and new people, and he did that. He took a voice class. Um, he went to a voice teacher, and he said it, it changed everything. He literally sold like three pitches in the following month because, or, or speech classes or public speaking classes or even a comedy class or an improv class um, would help. And if any of these options will help you, I think um, you're going to be amazed at how much that effort will change your life. A lot of comics, a lot of performers are incredibly shy introverts in real life. It, it sounds very topical to take a voice class or to take, but it it forces you to push past a lot of fear. And and if you couple that with <laughs> therapy or or realizing that you should be her heard as much as any schmo on the street, you know, what you have to say is worthy of being heard, just like any other asshole. It's expression. And how you express yourself defines you in many ways. So good luck. Call back. I hope it helps. What else? Here's some ads. Manscaped is trusted by over 6 million men worldwide. <laughs> that number is always tricky, but there you go. Join the movement by going to manscaped.com for 20% off plus free shipping with the code Sarah. Now let me tell you something about Manscaped. My boyfriend, Rory, uses it because I gave it to him. But you know who else uses it? This guy, me, on my bush. It's crazy that this is something that they're just marketing for men because, uh, of course, women use it too. It's a beard trimmer. You can use it on your beard. But it's great. He can trim close to the bone, and by the bone, I mean the his balls. Um, but you could also put, you know, a... Uh, a filter on it so it doesn't go so short, you know? And that's also what I like him to use on his pubes because I don't like them too short. It's prickly. It feels like it's stabbing me. And I do the same with my perfectly manicured, trimmed but full triangle of a bush. The below-the-waist grooming leaders have a fourth-generation performance package. Inside, you'll find the Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer, weed whacker ear and nose hair trimmer, liquid formulations, and two free gifts. Spooky. See, it's, this is a very spooky ad because it's October and you know what that means. Spooky season is here and Manscaped is getting you set. Starting with their Lawnmower 4.0, this fourth generation trimmer also features a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents thanks to their advanced skin safe technology. It's very exciting. Also included is their weed whacker. This nose and ear hair trimmer is here to whack his weeds and any goblins that come his way. Both the lawnmower and weed whacker are waterproof. In the comfort of his home or in the wild waters, these tools are his best friends. And don't sleep on the Manscaped's Liquid formulations. First is the Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant. I mean, if he needs deodorant under his armpits, why not put deodorant on his balls? And can't forget about the Crop Reviver Ball Reviver to give his boys a boost. What? A Ball Reviver. See, I don't have the brand new one yet, but I can't wait because I'm excited about the Ball Reviver to give his boys a boost. What does that do? It lifts your balls? Get 20% off and free shipping with the code Sarah at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use code Sarah. Gift him the tools to slay his worst pubes and keep his dagger clean with Manscaped. Lomi. I just got myself a Lomi and we are so excited about it. Lomi allows me to turn my food scraps into dirt, into soil with the push of a button. Lomi is a countertop electric composter that turns scraps to dirt in under four hours. There's no smell when it runs and it's really, really quiet. It's beautiful. It looks like something from the Apple store. Thanks to Lomi, I have way less garbage each week. And I have to say, like, 
I'm just excited to put my banana peels in it because my banana peels smell when you open the trash can and it really grosses Rory out, like that smell of sweet banana. But all that stuff, all those food scraps go into the loamy and then it turns to soil and you put it on your motherfucking plants. Since I got my loamy, I throw out way less garbage. That means it's not going into landfills and producing methane. Instead, I turn my waste into nutrient-rich dirt that I can feed to my motherfucking plants, y'all. If you want to start making a positive environmental impact or just make cleanup after dinner that much easier, Lomi is perfect for you. Head to Lomi.com slash Sarah and use the promo code Sarah to get $50 off your Lomi. That's $50 off when you head to L-O-M-I dot com slash Sarah and use promo code Sarah at checkout. Food waste is gross. Lomi is your solution. You'll want to move quickly as they're over 80% sold out for October. And we're back. Hello, Sarah. My name is Emily, and I am calling you from freezing cold Chicago. (laughs) As a member of the tribe and a person whose work is with Jewish college students, I wonder if you could offer them some advice on how to feel proud and brave in their Jewish identities. With anti-Semitism up everywhere in college campuses under a microscope, they are understandably very nervous to disclose their Judaism to the people around them. Uh, This is because of pressure from every single direction, pressure related to Israel, pressure related to white supremacy, and everything in between. As a person who grew up somewhere without a lot of Jews and Mm -hmm. an adult who's been through a lot, um, I wonder if you have any fabulous advice that I could pass on to them for how to continue to thrive despite the increasing pressure on Jews in this country. Thank you so much. I love what you're doing, and I hope you have a beautiful day. Great question. Uh, I mean, I I can't believe this is real, but I just read, granted, in the New York Post, and then I had to very ver- verify it in other publications, but um, about how nine different law groups at UC Berkeley have created Jewish free zones, meaning no Zionist speakers. And that really scares me. It's scary for obvious reasons. And it's scary because these are progressive groups. And I know how they see this. They hear about Palestine and the occupation and that, you know, this terrible never-ending occupation and without any other facts or knowledge, conflate Jews with the Israeli government. They conflate American Jews with Israel. Like, I'm from fucking New Hampshire, dude, (laughs) you know? And most of all, they have redefined or fallen prey to the redefinition of Zionism as racism. I have family in Israel. My sister moved to Israel with her five kids. They are liberal Zionists. Now, what is Zionism? If you look it up, it is just the belief that there should exist a Jewish state. That's what progressives like me, but not me, (laughs) um, are calling Zionism racism or pro-apartheid or, you know, like it, it's really scary. I mean, I, I can take it from the right, but I can't take it from the left. It, it's so upsetting. Now, a liberal Zionist like my family in Israel are, is they believe there should be a, a Jewish state, just like there are many, many Muslim states who no one has a problem with on the left. In, in pro- the progressive left. So it's it's perplexing. Of course, the progressive Zionist wants a two-state solution. They don't want a continuation of, they don't want the occupation. They want a Palestinian state. Two states, fucking King Solomon, that shit for all I care. A two-state solution. So to just say, we can be anti-Zionist, and to equate that with being anti-racist is bananas. And uh, I find it very worrisome that progressives on the left 
a place where I reside is being kind of co-opted by this and that it's okay. I am anti-racist, but to be anti-Zionist is not to be anti-racist. It's to be anti any kind of Jewish state. Please know that. God, we have no baseline truth, and it's very hard to talk about anything like this, you know? Now, of course, there are Zionists, just like there are Muslims, Islamists, that want it all, all or nothing, the whole country for them. These people on both sides of the issue keep Israel from having peace and a sweet-ass two-state solution. Two states side by side, equal. But yeah, a lot of Zionists, like my family in Israel, are liberal, progressive. They want a two-state solution. They want an end of, to the occupation. Um, they want freedom of movement for all. Equality, true equality, justice. So again, it's about not sharing a baseline truth that gets us to this place where progressives are being just totally unconsciously anti-Semitic. <laughs> and it, it frightens me. I can take it from the right. But oh, my heart on the left, you know, it's like when a movement to end the occupation doesn't include or join forces with g Jewish groups fighting daily for the same thing for their Palestinian brothers and sisters. It's why aren't they being included in that? Because they they need them to be the bad guys. It's very odd, very odd. But blaming Israel alone for the occupation without acknowledging, and they are to blame a big part of it, of course, but without acknowledging or educating yourself about Hamas's part in this? Marona me, I say. It's ignorant. I think there has to be conversations, op-eds written, human connection, education, not retreat, not hiding your Jewishness for your Jewish students, getting back to your actual question, but showing what it means to you to be Jewish and bringing that to others. For me, I'm godless, but culturally, I am Jewish. Ethically, I am Jewish, though I think you don't have to be Jewish to be ethical, obviously. <laughs> but we sadly do not have the reciprocation that other minorities seem to have and that Jews fight, often fight, for others more than any other peoples, I would say. I would have the lips to say. We fight for, we tend to fight for others passionately, but very few non-Jews fight for us, and it's a thing. But anyway, I don't, I, why do I always get pulled back into this conversation? <sighs> Maybe it won't always be a thing. I hope not. So don't hide, express, and connect. That's our best bet. What else? Hey, Sarah. It's Byron from Columbus, Ohio. And I would like you to regale us <laughs> those stories of your favorite cousins and your favorite aunt and uncle. I would like to know the extended part of the Silverman clan's family. Thank you. Oh, I don't know. I mean, my nieces and nephews, my auntie Martha. There's no way to really answer this. It's too many. It's too much. Two random stories that I've probably told. Auntie Martha. I remember when a comedian friend killed himself, Manish Tana Lailoza, and his um, memorial was on a weekend where I was maybe going to go to New York and see a guy I was stooping. And I felt guilty about it. And I asked my Auntie Martha, and she goes, go towards joy. Your friend is gone. He doesn't know if you're at the memorial. The memorial's for you. The memorial's for the people going. But uh, if you have a chance at joy, go towards joy. And I was like, oh, fuck yeah, Auntie. She's a therapist, by the way. And then, oh, my youngest niece. I don't know, these are two very different stories. But these are the things that just popped out. My youngest niece, Shishi, who is in uh, the army now, when she was teen, she's the youngest. So when she was teeny tiny, they were my sister and her husband and their five kids were living in a kibbutz in Israel on a kibbutz. I think you live on it. You live in it. You live on it. 
Yeah. And uh, my sister Laura went to visit and, you know, all the kids are sharing like a room. So she painted like the wall by each of their beds, you know, a different color or a different like design. So they'd each have like their own kind of special spaces. So for Shishi, she was like three, maybe four. And Laura, so Laura put little like Tinkerbell stickers all over. And I know I told this story a while ago, but I love it so much. And then after Laura left, Shishi, who was three or four, was like picking off the Tinkerbell stickers. And Susie, her mom, my oldest sister, was like, sweetie, why are you pulling off the stickers? You, you don't like Tinkerbell? And she said, no. <laughs> and, and Susie said, why, why don't you like Tinkerbell? And she said, she had an excellent reason why. She said, she does not love Wendy. And I, I say it because she had this broken English because Hebrew was her first language because she was so little when they moved there. She does not love Wendy. She had this little raspy voice. Ugh. And it's fucking true. Like, Tinkerbell was so not a sister, you know? Like, she just, she was like women against women, man. I love it. Anyway, there's no real way to answer that question, so that's my answer. What else? Hi, Sarah. This is Gus from Sunnyside, Queens, New York. And I was just randomly thinking, I remember on the Hulu show, I Love You, America, you did a bit with Fred Armisen, and it was like at a Quiznos oh, type he's shop Jesus. where you were talking about favorite movies. And you had mentioned that you didn't really get into Dune. <laughs> I was just wondering, even though, you know, it's uh, the remake has already been out for a little bit. I was wondering if you've seen it and if you were able to connect to this version more. I don't know. That was just uh, something that popped into my head. All right. That's it. Thanks. <laughs> That happens to be true, I, but I mean, it, I said it randomly, but it, uh, it happens to be true. Yeah, I, I didn't. But Dune came out when I was like 11. Or when did Dune come out? Like 82 or something? The, that, I don't know what was the original, but like the one when we were kids. Although, the, isn't that the ideal age group? I don't know. I didn't like it. I, I think I left in the middle. It was long. I don't really like epics unless it's a Scorsese movie. <laughs> But no, I did not see the new one. I'm sure it was very good. But it's just, I don't know. I'm not a big sci-fi person unless it's like Severance or something like that. Would you say Severance is sci-fi? I would, right? Because it's like they magically forget and they're going down the, I mean, it's science fiction. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah I love that. I do love that kind of sci-fi, but I'm not like a big like um, post-apocalyptic post uh gal. Does that make sense? Is that what Dune is? No, I guess What's it's Dune like about? another planet? Or like another galaxy? Fantasy. More fantasy. Yeah. I don't think it takes place on Earth. Anyway. I'm not a big fantasy, like, um, I mean, though I love dragons, um, the dragon show. You know, I don't know what it's called, but the dragon show, you know, I like that shit. All right, what else? Hi, Sarah. My name's David. I wanted to uh, comment about your comment about asshole golfers. Um, some probably. I'm sure there are some, but like Tiger Woods, I, yeah, he's pretty much a really intelligent person, a great athlete. Um, has he been kind of public with his problems. Yeah, and we all have problems. We all are, have been public now and then with our problems. But, you know, that generalization is probably not going to do you any good. Um, this is coming from an older guy who's just trying to help. I wish you the best and hope to hear from you soon. My name's Dave. Thanks, Dave. You know what? You're right. That was not a nice generalization. 
Plus, my stepmom is a kick-ass golfer, and golf is her joy, and I love her a million trillion billion, so good point. Thanks, Dave. You helped me today. What else? Hi, Sarah. This is Sarah. My husband and I have three beautiful daughters, 15, 12, and 10. With all the estrogen running wild in our house, my husband insisted on having only male pets. (laughs) We have an eight-year-old male dog who is my favorite child. And during the pandemic, we adopted a male cat, Dusty. Dusty is a wonderful cat who acts more dog-like than cat. He loves to play, go for walks. He's really kick-ass. But here's the issue. Dusty has this toy which resembles a tail on a stick. Well, now it is his special toy. He carries it around the house in his mouth and the tail rubs between his special parts. His dick, because he's neutered. Well, I think it's funny, and my girls and I have had many interesting conversations about it. But I had to actually Google, do neutered cats masturbate? If anyone ever monitors my search history. (laughs) Anyway, now that the girls are having friends come back over to our house again, this cat has no issue masturbating in front of anyone. And there is high-pitched moaning. How do I manage this with kids and their parents? The older kids think it's hilarious and get a kick out when he's doing it. But 10-year-old girls, I'm just not comfortable with these conversations. Yes, masturbation is normal. And yes, we're okay with it. We accept Dusty for who he is. I'd love to have your advice on how to deal with our little problem. Thanks for listening. Say hi to Mary for me. First of all, I didn't know cats did that. I think of them as much more chill. But yes, Mary, who is 10, now fully sexually assaults one of our couch pillows. And it is bizarre. And it, I'm not kidding. It it looks violent. It's uh, I did videotape it one time from like I was in the stairs and she didn't see me. And it felt really dirty that that I felt like a pornographer, like it feels wrong, but I just wanted to be able to show Rory. I guess it's a it's a dominance thing, I believe, um, for dogs. And so I'm guessing also for cats. But I I don't know how this suddenly is happening with Mary in her 10th year on this planet. And I don't know what to do. I I'm, my plan is to not do anything at all. She doesn't do it in front of others. As a matter of fact, when I videotaped her from the stairwell, about two and a half long minutes in, she looked it. She looked up and like locked eyes with me and and stopped. Which is funny because I just remembered I used to have a joke about a fun game when you're having sex is to lock eyes with your dog. And see who looks away first. Something like that. I never remember my old jokes, but it was something like that. Anyway, she saw me watching and she stopped. So, And then I felt awful, like I shamed her. But it's really, really weird. I mean, yeah, I don't know what to tell you what to do. Maybe can you tell your cat, does your cat respond to uh, no? (laughs) I don't know. That's a no. I mean, you don't want to shame your cat, but also it's a cat. I mean, I don't know. You can't really go like... That's private for when you're alone. It's hard to convey that to a to a cat. I mean, listen, dogs, I don't know, go straight for my crotch sometimes, and you just got to say like, oh, he must smell my vagina. I don't know. I'm just kidding, but that probably would be a good response. Well, it's time to say goodbye. Dad, we're winding down. I'm saying goodbye. We're wrapping up. And this is when I say subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts and check us out on YouTube if you like watching with your eyeballs. Bye. Hey! Hey, I wanna f- Hey! Hi! Hey, you fucker! Hey! Subscribe here so you don't miss an episode. And you can click here to watch the last episode if you missed it.